This is number seven, the Coffee House Writers Group Podcast. Okay, okay, so what to say this week? Well, we have uh, Scott McClelland on the podcast today. He is a relatively new member of Coffee House Writers Group, but has been very consistent coming to the Long Beach Critique fairly often and becoming a well-recognized face, as well as becoming a new member of our advisory board. He has brought many a story to us uh, with, with quick turnovers, bringing one new story, then another new story, these turning them out pretty quickly. And I'm fairly impressed. And his works always do really great things with the voice. He does things with the dialects, and he's also very into the characters' names, to name just a few things uh, about him. You'll hear some of his work on the podcast, and he'll give you some advice specifically on how to get published. And the title of this podcast is How to Get Published in 180 Days. And here on the podcast, we like to present you with varying opinions from the group. Opinions that may not always agree with each other. You'll hear one different type of expert recommend a different type of thing. And you're going to not just hear that only here. You'll hear that everywhere. Everyone has a different opinion on how you break into writing, how you write well, what rules should be obeyed or disobeyed, forgotten about, how to get started. And one of those controversial things is, should you get your stuff published even if you're not being paid for it? Does exposure qualify as payment? I don't have those answers for you. I have my own opinion. I ask Scott his opinion. And it is up to you to decide for yourself. There's really no correct way to write. That's no better illustrated than by the differing opinions of the readers. Some people simply adore books that I could never get into and vice versa. I can often see the strength of one book. Even if I don't like the book as a whole, there's something I can usually take away from it. Even some very well-renowned books... And while I would prefer not to name names, I'm not putting down these books, because it's just my opinion, but I like to illustrate of how you can take away from something that you may not completely like. And one of those things that I gave a chance was All the Light We Cannot See, which did a great job with metaphors. Too many metaphors, in my opinion. But it really showed me how to use them and use them well. And then also Cormac McCarthy's The Road, very popular wasn't for me, but he absolutely nails the fragmented sentence. That really showed me better than any other book how you don't need the complete sentence to make the picture and your point. And that breaks a rule of writing. But if it's something that works, then why not do it? Because I don't know about you, I don't write to make the English language aficionados happy with it. I write for people who... I care about understanding what I'm writing, as opposed to merely the language itself being correct. Good example, if you say is not in casual conversation, most of the time it sounds really weird. And in many circumstances, ain't sounds like how you would talk to someone. So that you're talking more like a person than a robot. By the way, one of the other things we talk about is, with Scott is writing how characters talk, not how they sound, which is something he's been harping on at the Long Beach Critique, where you're not making apostrophes to cut off words to make it sound more like the actual syllables, as if you're subtitling it to uh, illustrate exactly how funny it is someone's talking, but rather use the words they would use, or you can even use duh instead of the. It just reads easier. But again, that's just one opinion, and there's bound to be some other well-vetted writing advice forum that says the exact opposite, so take that as whatever you will. Now, getting published is not something you should under or overvalue. It certainly doesn't demonstrate the quality of a writer, but I've met unpublished writers who are just brilliant and people who have a few novels out there who leave a little something to be desired. 
And that's one reason why at Coffee House Writers Group, when you show up, everybody is put on the same level. And why we always say that we value people who come, even if they're not professional writers or editors or anything like that, because their insight may be even more valuable than someone who has more experience. There's really just no way to see someone's background and say, ah, I know how good of a critiquer they're going to be. And if you'd like some insights on how to give a good critique in writings groups, join us for our next podcast. We'll be talking with John Lowell, who we've name dropped a couple times throughout the various podcasts. Until then, let's talk about getting published. So here we go, podcast number seven. aspect um there was a group in pennsylvania that i was in and you had to like pay this annual fee which was not a lot but i mean it was money and you know you got everybody's work and had to go and <laughs> take it home with you and do the homework of, of critiquing it and then coming back with your critiques the following weekend i just don't want you know if i want if i'm going to spend time on writing i, <laughs> I either want to be reading something that is really, really good that I want to learn from or writing myself. So I, I want to, you know, do that. So this group is perfect because we just, you can hand your stuff out, you read it aloud, and then the critiques come through not only verbally, but also if people are marking them on the page. And I just think that's fantastic. I'm also impressed that you come with a piece to read every week. <laughs> I've got a lot of, <laughs> I have a lot of things in the hopper. That's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've, I've, uh, I, you know, the, the progression of this, you know, I, I got into this very quickly and, uh, and it happened fast and I kind of had a lot of success very quickly. And now I've sort of got a lot of stuff that I need to decide of what, what I'm going to do with. So I'm really kind of using the group to sort of possibly focus me in on one that's maybe the best, you know. And it's not just a buildup of things that have accumulated over time, which is for me that when I first joined this group, I had this big backlog of stuff that had never been seen by people outside my friends and family. Right. Yeah. And But you end up coming and you, you say, I just wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's usually, I, I won't bring in like the first draft but I mean, you know, at least I, I mean, I, I, if I write it that afternoon, I'll go back and I'll revise it. And as far as I was able to revise, then I'll say, you know, okay, I just wrote this, you know. Uh, but I mean, I wrote it. To, I, I did bring a piece in a couple of uh, weeks ago where I said, you know, it was literally written that afternoon. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of fun to be able to get the feedback. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would, ne I, I sort of, uh, I'm one of those people that believes in, uh, you know, when you write the first, when you write it first, you're just kind of vomiting. And whatever you're not concerned about anything and just get it out and then uh go back to it and, and revise and revise and revise but I, I i couldn't bring anything in that was just like you know off the cuff i couldn't write it 10 minutes before i left <laughs> bring it in. i wouldn't be able to do that i have to revise or very few of us can yeah you said that you gained some notoriety in the fields quite quickly how did you do that well um I sort of was kidding around, you know, and I said, we should call this, you know, how to, how to uh, learn to write fiction and, and get published in 180 days. And that it's kind of accurate uh, of what happened to me. I, uh, as you, I've mentioned to many, many guys, uh, my wife and I ran a theater company in Pennsylvania called the Roadhouse Theater for 20 years. And so I've been involved in telling stories my whole life, you know. Um, and so when I retired from the theater, <laughs> the local newspaper, uh, editor is got this guy named Doug Reeder who's a friend of mine he wrote the he was the editor of the entertainment section of the paper and he wanted me to write a weekly column and I said well that's very nice but I I don't know anything about writing you know and he said oh well you won't have to don't worry he said you just put your perspective down write what you want to write and then he goes we'll we'll send it through the process of editing here you know there's I guess like five editors it would go through like five editors and he said by the time it comes out in the newspaper you can compare it to what you did and and then look at what we did and he goes it'll take you like maybe six weeks or more right around six weeks you'll you'll get it and when you're starting to write something that looks more like the finished product right exactly it wouldn't didn't take me long to go, oh oh okay they, oh and then they put that there and ah oh, that's great so, you seeing know. the patterns yeah and then i also was very lucky because i mean i obviously have a, a 
a vast network of friends in the arts. Many of them are writers. Um, I have a, my best buddy is, uh, he lives in Chicago and he edits the manuals, the, the owner's manuals for all the Sears and Kmart products. He lives in Chicago. So pretty much I would just take them and pit paste his version in and over to, over top of mine. And then I would go through and if there was something I wasn't exactly sure I liked, I might take his advice but change something you know so uh that was very lucky that i had someone who was a grammarian that could really keep me uh, from sending something really stupid looking in yeah, to get into a newspaper to get into a column most people have to break down the front door with a battering ram and and then this guy has to ask you please join us well i uh, yeah I, but i so, i think he just want i have a neat perspective on a lot i mean i you know i th i think i look at things differently and um i'm always I've always been a very uh, entertaining storyteller just in terms of like, uh, I guess you'd call it a rack on tour. So he wanted to get that somehow into the newspaper, my, my, uh, my opinions and, and, and my thoughts. And he ended up getting it for five years. And he saw that through the theater company. Yeah, we did a lot of stuff. It was kind of interesting. Like when we came to the, t to town and opened the theater company, one of the things that I, I noticed that were in the paper a lot, a lot of the pictures for the theater shows, they, the, they were the silliest pictures. Like people were sort of posed in this very unnatural way. They were, they were just so awkward. And, and uh, what I always like to do was to make an artistic expression type of photograph that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a scene from the play, but it, it tells us and it's evocative and tells us, a, gets us a sense, a feeling for what we're going to see in this play with the actors who are in it. That was very exciting, and, and and the guy who happened to be the head photographer, he was really into that because he didn't get to do any of that kind of stuff. So he would have us come over there into the studio, and we would create these incredible images. And a number of those images won awards for him in the state of Pennsylvania for best you know best photograph and stuff. And uh, many of our covers of the showcase that we were always called the showcase was the was the entertainment section, our theater often got the cover with our photographs because they were very evocative and some of those would end up on billboards and uh, one ended up in the uh the airport the erie international airport um and it's as an advertisement for showcase uh and it was it was kind of amazing and like the guy who was in that photo he like went down and took pictures with you know <laughs> and stuff so it was really interesting uh to be able to bring that to to them so i think all that considered and he had a lot of respect for our work so uh, I think he just wanted to hear from, from me for as long as he could. And I did it for five years and then that's when I quit. And, uh, oh, why? well, I just, the weekly grind of it, okay. um, it, it kind of, it was, and I was having to write more stuff and, you know, I was getting paid okay, but it wasn't like I was an employee. I mean, it's like. I'm writing three or four articles a week. Employ me, you know, <laughs> still a freelancer. I, just freelancing and it was a lot of work and I, and I took a long time to do it. Um, I spent a lot of hours, you know, I'm very slow. I was very slow at writing it. And so, um, and my wife was just saying the amount of time you spend and you get, you, you drive these places and interview these people. And, uh, you know, it, when it comes down to you, you're making like $4 an hour, you know? So after a while I just said, uh, yeah, you know, I really think I'm kind of done with it. I, I, I did it and I was happy with it, but that was at the end of 2013. And then, about three or four months went by and I realized that I really missed writing and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, and I just, you know, I'm so naive about it. I said, I said, well, I'm going to write fiction. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write fiction. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, uh, I'm going to write a novel. That's what I'm going to do. I'll write a novel. And you heard me say at the, at, at the uh, group thing that, uh, I've never read a novel in my life. <laughs> so I was going to write a novel having never read a novel. And I started that. Yeah, I started going and I was writing stuff and trying to play this Sheriff Daggett. And it was on and on. It went on forever. And there were scenes and chapters. And I was sending it to my poor friends who were reading it and giving me feedback. You know, it's really good, but there's this and this. And uh, I, I really didn't have any idea what I was doing. So I felt like instead of torturing my friends, I should really kind of sit down and figure out how to write fiction, what you need to do. And so in the old days, I would get books or something. But, um, now I could get on the internet and there's just, it's just an endless amount of stuff. And what happened was I finally somehow stumbled across a website called the review review. And that's a website that has a review of just about every literary magazine in the world. Practically. I mean, it's, it's just an exhaustive list and you can search through it 
and each one has a review and what kind of stuff they like and you can go link right to their website and look at their submission guidelines and see what they're all about and so that that was suddenly opened my eyes because even though I had never read a novel I, I I'd been reading short stories in the New Yorker magazine since I was about 13 or 14 years old and I had that all through my adult life that was always the first thing I would do is just open up read the short story if it bored me I would toss it but most of the time I would read them through so I was it wasn't like I was completely ignorant of fiction I mean I I read fiction so you didn't have novel reading in school what I, what I mean by I didn't read a novel was like any for pleasure I would no I would skip through stuff like I, I just okay when it, when it, they started describing some the way someone was dressed or the way they look and their car and I'm just like what, what happened to the guy with the knife I mean let's get ahead <laughs> to that part where we get, you know I, I, I those just, long romances were not for you yeah it wasn't for me and I I, I tend to even now in in my writing I, I tend to give very little description of what a person looks like or what a particular thing looks like because I want the reader to use their imagination. I want everyone to have their own picture of that character. So I give a very small amount of information, sometimes none. That way your your imagination is engaged. And I think that's the best way to get the reader uh, involved. What tools do you use to ground the reader then, if not those details? Uh, things that are happening, I, you know, narration, uh, dialogue. You can, you know, learn a lot about a person through through dialogue, and then description of what's happening to the person. And so I think that those those things, narration moves it from A to B to C to D to Z. Dialogue reveals a lot about the character, and then the other parts fill it in. But I, I what I what I like is to be able to decide on my own what a person looks like now. Obviously, there are situations where, you know, if some guy's a really big, heavy set guy who wears, you know, a white suit and, it's, you know, he's got sweat under his arms. I mean, that's important. If that's important, it's germane to the story, we have to, we have to describe that person. But you just don't general, like those needless details. Yeah, the stuff that goes on and on and on. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. At the restaurant, yeah, it's a fancier. I mean, that's, it was a fancy restaurant. It's probably good enough for me. I, I, then I've got my own version of it, you know, and it smelled like this or you get the steaks or whatever that's all i need i don't need a whole bunch of uh stuff and, and then i can have my own restaurant or the, give the uh the you know the reader the imagination so when i discovered the review review i just started reading everything i could find on writing fiction how to write it and i i realized i'm like well, wow now there's like ten thousand magazines that i can submit short stories to and so uh I was sort of a victim of that and also a beneficiary of it because what I ended up doing was taking my parts of my novel and sort of trying to, to winnow it down into a short story. And it was like a 9,000 word short story that had a 3,000 word backstory. <laughs> <laughs> and this novelist friend of mine who is a really great guy, he's a very successful novelist, um, he said, short stories really don't have... 3,000 word backstories. That's, that's kind of a novelistic, <laughs> uh, device. You know, he, he said, uh, that could be a whole story by itself. So, you know, you, you know, if there's backstory in a, in a, in a short story, you know, it's sort of like A, B, C, E, D, F, and then that's it. Just, you go back just a little bit, you know, but that's, that's the order. You don't, you don't get to, just should follow along pretty, pretty well. So I was able then to, to, Sorry, I was a freed up. I felt like I, I took a whole lot of things out, but it still was like a five thousand word story. And I've read it. For, I read it for the group. It's called Liminality, and uh, I worked so hard on that um, for 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 the over the period. I just worked on it every day for like five, six, seven hours, um, revising it and working it, and having friends come over and sending it to people and parts of it. And finally, I felt like I had it done, and it was. And uh, I sent it out. To a number of publications, I got uh, several denials, uh, which is natural. And then uh, all of a sudden, on March 19th, so I was like in the fall of 2014, and right around March of uh, March, sometime in March, uh, it was picked up for publication in Gargoyle Magazine. It's going to be in this this year's, uh, which is the 40th anniversary edition of Gargoyle Magazine. So that was a huge thing to get that. Um, f felt great, but it also felt like a great relief because I'd been sort of just, you know, wallowing and, and, and sort of swimming through the muck of this story that I wanted to get out there. And uh, when I was done with it, I was kind of relieved and I'm like, okay, well, 
what's next? Cause you get I'm, to move on to the next thing. I'm really excited. I, but I didn't know what was going to happen. And um, so I continued to really study. One of the things that I had a hard time wrapping my mind around, and I still do uh, sometimes, is to show the story, not tell the story. And that's a, that's a really common thing that, that writers... Beginning writers you know, really struggle with. Struggle with. And I still struggle with it quite a bit. You know, but... Um, I always give the example, and I, it's it, uh, our friend John, who's uh, who's one of the members of the yeah, group. John Lowell. Is it John Lowell or Gorsh? It's for, that's his okay. way he goes by author wise. Okay, yeah. So he, uh, when I gave my example one day, he he said that's actually a really great example because it's like I said if if you know it says if you write, um, my mom yelled at me from my bedroom window, uh, that's telling the story. But if you write, you know, Scott Rossiter McClellan, get up here this instant. My mom shouted from the window upstairs. Um, or the, my bedroom window upstairs, you know, we know now, you know, <laughs> you're in trouble and she's shouting and, and, uh, she's mad. So that's showing the story versus telling the story. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great other, other ways to describe that, but I was really kind of obsessed with that idea. And it was then that I, I had found different places that offered writing services that could help you with your novel, your story, help you get published. Um, all these different services. So at this time, you're just really self-educating yourself with everything you can find. And I mean, I'm reading short story after short story on, online. I, mean, I was reading a dozen short stories a day. Is this still um, in Pennsylvania? Still in Pennsylvania. And I, I, I was, I, I had Google uh, on my tablet, so I was reading the beginnings of, of novels and books that you could read for free. So I, I was just <laughs> reading an incredible amount. Uh, so then um, I, I was obsessed with that idea. So I. I I, I ended up pitching this article to the review review about writing about writing services. And I ended up writing about a, a website that's called write by night. They're a terrific group of a lo very large group of writers. And uh, the woman who runs it, her name is Justine. And uh, she will talk, she talks to these person person personally and figures out what they want, what their needs are. And then she'll put them with the right writing coach and, uh, and, and go from there. And, and uh, so I was able to talk to her interview her by phone, uh, a couple of the writing coaches and a couple of their, uh, people that they they have as clients. And then I also went to carve magazine. It has carve magazine has uh, writing services. And, uh, I was able to do the same thing with them, talk to them and the coaches and also some of the people who have, uh, written or, or have been clients of theirs. And through that, I, I developed a really good friendship with, uh, this writing coach named Steve. Adams and he's a pushcart prize winning author and he's really good and he just my age and we just kind of really clicked and hit it off and so we uh, stay in touch by email and sometimes by phone and we talk and he really kind of helped me with that whole show the story thing and then I was able to learn from every single one of the people I talked to I learned quite a bit and I was able to ask him questions like how do you show the story, not tell the story? What are your opinions? So I got a lot of information there. I wrote the article, and it was on the review. Review, it still is. And then uh, I was I was starting to get into the repetitive motif. It's kind of like Beckett, Samuel Beckett. I don't know if you've ever read any Samuel Beckett. Um, I have not. Waiting for Godot, he wrote that. But he also wrote a lot of uh, novels and short stories. And he uses often a very repetitive motif. I, again, I could give you an example. So, so, so let's let's go through one of those examples right now. Okay. What what exactly makes the repetitive motif, and is it uh, something that we should be striving for at some times? Is it a style? Is it something we avoid? It's a style, I think, is what is what it is. Um, and you'll remember this one. You. The, the main word in the repetitive motif you, you didn't like, and I haven't changed it yet, but I'll... I'll <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I remember right. this now. Yes, yeah. Um, but I think here, this paragraph not only shows the story very well, it's completely showing the story, um, but it has that repetitive motif. So uh, it's this is the opening paragraph. It was a lashing rain. It lashed crumbling streets and abandoned cars. It lashed overgrown lawns and wind-churned trees. It lashed houses that were still houses, and the charred skeletal remains of houses that once were. It lashed roaming packs of wild dogs and the scattered corpses on whose entrails those dogs fed. Corpses of people who gave up or fell prey. People who fell prey to roaming packs of ruffians and marauders. Ruffians and marauders who looted stores and businesses, invaded homes, and took whatever they wanted, including lives. 
ruffians and marauders who left corpses in the streets for the dogs, and the scent of death hung in the air, no matter where you ran to, no matter how far or fast or away, the scent of death chased you and found you and clung to you like sweat or the wet of a lashing rain. So I think it's almost like a poetic, it has a bit of... That'll be in speeches a lot. If you look at some of the great speeches by Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King Jr., they'll use that in their speeches to hit back on certain points and leave them in. And it's, and it's generally considered a poetic way of, of going about. In fiction, people will often stray from that so that they are not given the information more than once. But instead, what we're doing here is we're trying to use it to our advantage right? in a different way. Well, I think that, uh, and I, this is isn't an original thought by me in any way, but I mean, I think that really good stories are poetic. And I think really good poems are also tell stories uh, often. So I think to be able to meld those things together, is, I think is, is a good idea. I don't do it all the time, but that's kind of, I, I was in, that, that was kind of what I was striving for. Uh, and I was getting into the summer and what happened was there was this girl who was cutting our grass and uh, you know where this is going. And uh, she, she's, she's a very young looking girl. She looked like she was about 11 or 12 and she's slightly awkward, but uh, she cut the grass for $5 and she was always with her grandmother. And I noticed that whenever I spoke with her, the only thing she would ever say to me in response was, yeah, which was okay. And I thought it was kind of odd that she only charged $5 yeah. to cut the grass. She was cutting the next door neighbor's grass yeah. and our grass. And so she would say, yeah, even when it didn't make sense as an answer. Well, yeah, that's what happened. Um, I, I, but I mean, one thing I want to mention is that she was, she was very rigid about the way she mowed the lawn. The lines had to be perfectly straight. And she, it was like she went in the same tire marks every week, right, right down. There was never any variation. And she cut the grass every week. Uh, and so I ended up going into a store nearby and she was with her grandmother again. And I came up to her and I said, what day next week are you coming to cut the grass? And she kind of looked at me sort of awkwardly and said, yeah. And I did, I was taken aback for a second. I looked at her grandmother and her grandmother gave me this look like, okay, do you get it? Do you get it? I'm like, oh, okay. So I understood that that she must be on the autism scale, something like that. And I wasn't sure what happened, but suddenly the story started to write itself in my mind as I was in the checkout line and I, I was going to grab something or try to write it down. I couldn't find anything. And then I, I, I said, well, I'm only two minutes from home. So I, I got in the car, I raced home. I handed my wife the grocery bag and I said, get out of my way. I got to get to a keyboard, sit down. And I sat down and I furiously wrote what was inside of me. And, and, and it was coming out and it was the first time for me that, I was able to do that um, where I was writing and I, I felt like I wasn't in control of what was happening. Uh, and that's not usual for me. I, I wasn't, I, I knew I wanted to do that. I, I thought I might someday, uh, to be honest with you, I would watch authors on Charlie Rose and other shows and they would say, oh, you know, I, I don't know where it's going usually. I don't try to control it. I just let it come out. The characters talk and I, I never know what they're going to say. And I used to think, Boy, that is such bull. I mean, you have to have a plot. You've got to have to have an outline. And it turns out that they were completely right. I think some of the best writing is, you know, it's the old, it's from thousands of years ago, the muse, you know, comes. And I remember very specifically writing that story, which uh, turned out to be titled My Yellow Cup with the Tiger on, and we can talk about that or not. It, 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 used, the, it used the repetitive motif, and it was very, very much a, a showing story. Because I was trying, I, I thought, what if I could write a short story that just showed everything? That's what it came out to be. And I, I do notice that those stories where you're trying to show often involves dialogue. And your stories are generally fairly dialogue heavy. Yeah, they do have a lot of dialogue. That's true. And you have actually written stories that are just a dialogue. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a great tool for any writer to challenge themselves to do, even if they don't do anything with it, try to write a dialogue story where you tell the entire story just in dialogue. You can't use and he said, she said, nothing. It's all dialogue. And of course, you can't like cheat and go like, oh, I'm going to pick this gun up now and I'm going to point it at you and shoot you and you'll be dead. I mean, that's not, it doesn't <laughs> work. You have, to, you have to let the story come from the dialogue. And Bartleby Snopes is uh, 
an online magazine that holds a dialogue only contest every year and, and I thought that was fascinating so I read a lot of them and I, I wrote a couple myself um, they were the the magazine that published my yellow cup with the tiger on and that was a, an incredibly gratifying experience um, because I wrote it and I was pretty excited about it I did send it out to people I got some comments and as I said I revised it but so the thing that's really exciting about Bartleby Snopes or at least was for me was that they offer feedback to everyone who sends a story and if you if you if you check that box if you want feedback they will if they reject your story they'll send you feedback which is great. I've never heard of anybody else doing that it's pretty cool so that's why I was very interested in, in submitting to them and I submitted uh, my yellow cup with the tiger on on a Wednesday I submitted it I think to five places and uh, they sent me back something on Friday saying we'd like to publish the story so that was very exciting it was my second publication but what was even more exciting was that it was going to be online so all my friends uh, on Facebook and all these places who haven't been any of my beta readers or anything like that they were when are we going to be able to read something that you wrote because the first one was picked up for publication but it still hasn't been published so you know <laughs> they're like come yeah. on so so it was really exciting um they got to read it and they went and they sent it to all their friends and I mean it ended up winning um story of the month in July of 2014 uh, by a landslide, because, not because it was better than the other stories, just because so many of my friends just like, you know, piled up and, 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 and went there and, and liked the story. So it was great. It was a great experience. And I won and they pay you for winning the contest. And then your story appears in um, the written or the, uh, you know, the published version of the magazine uh, in the, the next version, which was in February of this year. And so, um, but also we were talking about the dialogue stories and I just wanted to, that the, the the dialogue contest does not appear on online. It appears in the this publication first. So you have to. That's what the, the one thing that's really new in the publication is you get to see the dialogue. So you story. already have to have it in order to know about it. No, you, you, they they advertise it everywhere, um, and you can you can go read about it. And they have a lot of. Oh, they just don't publish it online. They don't publish it online. They publish it here first, and I think it goes online then later, uh, like like a year from now. It'll those stories will be will be available online. So that's sort of the impetus for buying this is to see what stories won um, the, the, the dialogue only contest. So this is, this is, I'm just going to read this very short uh, part at the beginning of this story. It's called Boogeyman by Rebecca McDowell in first place in the dialogue only story. Who's there? You know who it is. I'm not scared of you. Oh, you ain't. No, my mom said you're not real. Moms, they say a lot of things. Yeah. My dad said it too. Oh, well, in that case, daddies are another matter. Are you making fun of me? Only a bit. You're not real. I know it because there's no room in there for you. Aye, so certain. You know how big I am, yeah? No, but there's no room in the closet for anyone. Maybe I ain't in there, yeah? Where are you? Why does it matter? I ain't real, remember? Go back to sleep. Nothing bad will happen to you. That's just the beginning, so I mean, it's... It's pretty pretty funny, and I like how he's like this sort of this Irish imp or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, You're very good with the voices. Yeah, I <laughs> do a lot of voices, yeah. Well, it's written. It's written with that, it, like, I ain't. It's like E apostrophe N-T. So it's like really it's meant, meant to be like Scottish or British or something. I want to say something about the title, too, which is really funny, because I, I, call, I didn't know what to call. I think it was called uh, just the girl's name at first, Allie. I had this line in there with my yellow cup with the tiger on. Steve Adams, who I mentioned earlier, he and I were, were talking about it uh, on the phone once, and uh, he also read it uh, as an email one time for me, just as a favor. And uh, <laughs> he said, "You have this sentence that keep, it ends with a preposition, and I know you keep using it, so I know you're you're doing it intentionally, but it, it's sort of like it's aggravating to the to the reader, uh, at least someone who knows, you know, that you're ending it with a preposition. So I don't know if you want to maybe get rid of that, or if you're in love with it, you've got to figure out." make it work somehow and I, I fretted about it all night long and then finally like at four in the morning I hadn't gone to sleep and it, it finally occurred to me I'm like I know I'll make that the title of the story so that you know that what you're going to read is not going to be usual usual stuff in terms of uh, writing and so you, you get the idea right from the beginning and uh, the story has no commas no quotation marks uh, it does have you know astro apostrophes for the for contractions but um, she's basically Asperger's syndrome, which is a, a, 
something on the autism scale. At least that's how I wrote her. I, I, I don't know that she really is. I'm just, you know, this is completely fiction. So uh, today I'm cutting grass at the brown house across the street and the brown house next to the brown house where the tall man who wears the white hat and black glasses lives. I get $5 to cut grass. Today I get $5 from the lady in the brown house and $5 from the tall man who wears the white hat and black glasses. Grammy with the red car keeps my money for me. She buys me my black cookies with white stuff in the middle. She buys me my milk. I drink my milk from my yellow cup with the tiger on. The tiger lives at the zoo. The zoo sells yellow cups with his picture on. When Grammy with the red car takes me to the zoo, I visit the tiger. He knows me. I stand on the red rock by the tree and wait for him to see me. My hair is brown and long and straight. I comb my hair in straight lines so it looks nice for the tiger. When he sees me, he comes over by me to talk. He says it's hot. He says having yellow fur with black stripes is hot when it's hot. He says, do you think it's hot, Allie? And I say, yeah. He says, I love you, Allie. He says, do you understand that I love you, Allie? And I say, yeah. So that's a good idea. <laughs> so the cup is, you know, it's something she drinks out of and she gets it at the zoo and uh, the rep repetition. And also she has, she doesn't have a name for anything. Everything is a description. Like her, her grandmother's not her grandmother. She's Grammy with the red car. I assume that her other grandmother has some other, you know, <laughs> different uh, car. Chris, yeah, some sort of uh, characteristic that she describes her as, and uh, so that. But but still, like uh, we mentioned, the black cookies with the white stuff in the middle. So I mean, we know those are Oreos, but I'm not saying you know she buys me my Oreos. Um, again, and that's a function of the fact that she only describes things, doesn't name them, but it also is a great way of showing, making that reader see it without telling them what it is. Really um, gives us the what perspective we're looking at, and not just. Right. Not just what it is, but how it's different. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so she's speaking about her grandmother at the beginning of this paragraph. After she goes, I touch my finger on the tiger's picture on my yellow cup with the tiger on. He knows me. After I touch the tiger's picture, I close my eyes. It's black inside my eyes, and when it's black inside my eyes, I can go. When I go, I go to the zoo. At the zoo, I don't stand on the red rock by the tree and wait for the tiger. I go inside where the tiger lives. Inside where the tiger lives, I don't see the tiger. I am the tiger. I walk on my tiger feet, and I am tiger strong. My tiger eyes and my tiger teeth are big. My tiger tail is long. I walk up to the cage around my tiger house and slink between the bars. I can do that. When I'm the tiger, I walk between raindrops. I walk my tiger body on the sidewalk that goes around the zoo. I walk my tiger body on the street outside the zoo. On the street outside the zoo, I walk my tiger body fast. I walk my tiger body so fast I start to run, and when I run, I run as fast as I can, and when I run as fast as I can, I fly. I fly my tiger body into the sky. I can do that. I fly so fast, I race the moon. I race the moon and the stars all the way into tomorrow. At tomorrow, I fly across the blue sky. When I fly across the blue sky, fire from my yellow fur burns behind me, and smoke from my black stripes comes out behind the fire. So, for me... The thing that I really think is interesting is obviously, you know, she's having a dream and, and, and something happens at the end. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, but as if, you know, flying <laughs> and burning, burning fire behind you wasn't extraordinary enough. But the thing that grabs me there is this line, uh, you know, I fly so fast, I race the moon. I race the moon and the stars all the way into tomorrow. Now, I just don't have any idea where that came from. I, I wasn't in control of that. I don't remember writing it. I, I, I would never write something like that. That's not something that I, I understand. And so that's what, to me, is like the magic of this, the muse and the magic of these extraordinary things can happen um, that are often not under your control. And I mean, for me, that line, I race the moon all the way into tomorrow. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, I, I'm asking you. I mean, does, I mean, what does that mean to you? Does that mean anything to you? I mean, do you do you understand it, but you but you don't understand what it means or you know what I mean? Do you erase the moon into tomorrow? I don't know. I don't know what happens. I mean, you race the moon, you race the moon. She's racing the moon. Like it's a race all the way into tomorrow. So I, I don't know. I guess she's flying so fast that she's like Superman. She can, <laughs> she can get to tomorrow before anyone else. I don't know. But to me, that's, that's magic. It's, it's just so exciting when something like that happens because I don't have to know what it means. And even the reader doesn't have to know what it means. I don't think it's just something that's, that's sort of up to everyone. And, and, and uh, those are those things that you sort of remember after you read it. I, I know a number of people wrote that in posts on Facebook and uh, 
another thing uh, was written was, you know, it, it's hot when it's hot, you know, and having yellow fur, it's hot <laughs> when it's hot. Everybody wrote that funny. And also the raindrop things, you know, I walk between the raindrops, which I've heard before in other places. But that's, uh, but this story ended up uh, quite amazingly then uh, in December, it was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, which is just like huge uh, in the short story world. Uh, not saying that I'm going to get picked for it or anything like that, but, uh, you know, as, as my friend Steve Adams said, um, it doesn't matter because from now on your biography begins, you know, Scott McClellan is a Pushcart Prize nominated author. So uh, that's not, that doesn't happen. It's hard to get published. It's even harder to get that kind of recognition. And to get published, you did all this research. Did you start from bare bones, just Google? Did you, are there, what was the path that you ended up taking from Google or Twitter to other sites that led you to more sites to got you to where you eventually found success? That was exactly it. And I think that, I think that, as I said, like the review review is so comprehensive and so many writing tips. Uh, and then other writers sent me other places that send writing tips. Like there's, there's a place called Aerogram Studios and Aerogram is spelled like A E O, you know, air, like an English version. And they, I, I sign up for a lot of, uh, you know, newsletters, which I think is a good idea because you can really get a lot of information. There's often writing tips, uh, tips on publishing, but those are all also all at, uh, at the review review. And I, I literally stumbled on the review by, by looking for, uh, writing tips and how to write short stories. And that's how I got to them. But, you know, uh, how to just, I mean, the, how to format your story to, to send it in, uh, how to, you know, how you need to really follow the guidelines of each different journal for submitting. Some of them want it blind. They don't want any information on the page with your name or who you are. They want to read every story. doesn't matter if it's for me or Solomon Rushdie. They, they want to read in blind. So you have to sort of have a blind version and, you know, and how they want it as a PDF. They want it as a word document. Some places don't aren't that sophisticated. They, you know, they just uh, want an email. But uh, most places use Submittable, which is um, the the engine that you can use, and what, you sign into it. Submittable is a free service. Uh, it, it it allows you to um, track all of the stories that you've submitted, which is very important because for the writer, the author, for for, for yourself, yeah. And so it shows you all the stories that have been submitted. Which ones have been declined? Which ones have been accepted? Which one? And it tells you where they are. It's in process. It's received. It's in process. Um, and then you know you, you can expect to hear back in such such a time. So it really keeps track of everything you're doing. And since most of them use that, it's a really great way to do that. And the other thing that's really important is is that when you send your story to multiple places, it's a simultaneous submission. And every place accepts simultaneous submissions. But it's really important that when the story is accepted. You have to go immediately to all the other places that you submitted it to and withdraw it. And submittable is just like a, you just click a box, check a box by all of them and just go boom. And they all get a thing saying, you know, you, well, you could, you write something you say, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, this story has been picked up. And I, I hope to publish later, you know, in your publication, but that's a really important thing to do because if they're like literally have it on their desk and ready to um, say, you know, we're going to, let's, let's notify him that we're going to accept a story. And you come back and say, oh, it was already accepted last week. You didn't do your job. You, you got to do it immediately. So that's stuff that you learn through this process. It's kind of, kind of like uh, travel sites where they're, they keep, at least the way they're advertised is we have more of a comprehensive thing. No, we have more of a comprehensive thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really recommend that anybody who's going to be doing any submitting to to, uh, uh, to any uh, literary magazines that they they just get a submittable submittable account because it's just it's free. And then what also is great is that you know it's, you just once you sign in on that from that that journal's website, all your information's there, your address, your, all your contact information. So you don't have to type that in. You just type in the name of the story and then you click on browse and download the uh the word or the pdf or whatever and you're and then just click submit and you're done so the first time you published anything writing after the after the newspaper first published fiction what did you end up using to get that done in terms of like in terms of like a, a service or a publisher if there was no service i again there uh there was a through the review 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 there was a uh an article about you know the, the 
the best magazines to, you know, submit to. I submitted to them. And then there were some other ones that said, you should really be submitting to this. And so I submitted, I, I got a list of about 22 together that I wanted. Some paid, some didn't. There were, con I entered it in contests. Um, and then um, I just decided those were the ones I wanted to do. And I went, went through it. And, and, and it's like I said, like, 95% of those use submittable, you know, um, and so it was really easy for me once it was chosen by Gargoyle Magazine, it was easy for me to say, you know, go back and just notify everyone. And I kind of felt bad because a couple of the contests were like $20 to enter. <laughs> so, but hey, I mean, you know, it was exciting to get that first, I mean, you go, you're over the moon, you know, it's like you've been working on this thing for a long time. And it really not only was a great feeling, but it, it released me to do so many more things and so um and then as we've talked about uh in the middle of all this my wife and i decided we're going to move to california <laughs> so we packed up in the summer of 2014 and we left uh in in uh, september october t that time and we came out here we didn't know where we were going to live we just traveled up and down from way up north all the way down to here just seeing friends staying at friends houses hotels just testing in california see out. which part you like yeah yeah we'd been here 15 years ago we did we did highway one from like the redwood forest all the way down to san diego so that's a nice. long long trip like that and that was a great trip um but uh yeah we just we ended up picking picking long beach you know it was, it was right for us we got a great incredible condo uh it's really great and uh i like the i like the area i really like it and uh and then found you guys and so now, uh, after all these beginnings that I've started, these the beginnings of stories that I've started, I'm able to finally uh, have some feedback on them, and it, it helps a lot. Propel them forward. Yeah, propel, to propel them forward and, and, and tell me what's wrong and, and what I need to do to fix them. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, if I can, if you don't mind, I have a story that was critiqued by the group, and, um, and I wanted to show the changes that were made to the, it's just a short little paragraph. Sure. I thought that was kind of cool. You know, I was like, cause I had one, you remember the little micro fiction story. I also discovered micro fiction in my, I didn't know micro fiction existed or nano fiction or whatever you want to call it. Flash fiction. I didn't know what that was. But I read some and I thought, well, I can do this. This is easy, but I didn't have my computer. So I just had my tablet. So I wrote this very short story on, on my tablet and uh, it ended up getting picked up for publication I read it to the group and I came home and I think it was like, we meet on Wednesday, I think maybe Thursday or Friday. They said, we're going to publish the story. It was every writer's resource. And I was hoping he was going to contact me about editing because there were several things that were said at the, at the group that I wanted to change. Uh, I saw what you guys were saying and I'm like, Oh, that definitely would make it better. But he didn't, he just published it. He was like, it's, it's in, it's up. I was like, oh, <laughs> so I was kind of apologizing to people last week or the week before saying, I'm sorry that it didn't get um, changed. Now, as you know, I, I love to write in, uh, I like to write about the South and I particularly like to write in, uh, in dialect of the South. Um, and we've talked quite, quite at length about uh, this idea that when we're writing dialogue, even though it's it's in the south they don't speak properly or proper english um we don't want to misspell the words like do and we don't want to put doing with an, uh, an apostrophe put the word doing and literally that that the reader will pick up on they'll start to say that i, I remember this story if you use the correct words if you use the correct words it, it gets it across. implies the rest right i remember uh this story further down uh my friend said when she read it she said that there, he brings a box of cigars to this doctor in, in a saloon. And she said, by the time I got to that line, I, I said, I said, cigar to myself, even though it's just written cigar. So she said, I was really into the, to the dialect. So this, this story is called the rampaging sons of the widow James. And this is the short first paragraph. There weren't nobody in Pucky's huddle, Missouri that wanted to see Byron dog willow hang except the Braithwaite family and Miss Coover, I suppose. Miss Coover hated Byron Dogwillow and weren't shy about saying so neither. One time she said, Byron Dogwillow is a black-toothed chin-wagon liar. She went on to say, that man's eating the food somebody's good coon dog could have. Miss Thickens looked stunned and said, Erna Lee Coover, what a terrible thing to say about another person. Then her and Miss Coover shared a big laugh. So that was what I brought to the group. Um, one of the things that the group said was that 
uh, later in the story there, a few paragraphs down, we learned that he was arrested for gunning down two horses um, that belonged to the Braithwaite family. And they said, gee, I, that's a real, that's really this, that, that, I want to know what happened there. How, why did he do that? So they said, maybe you could get that somehow more toward the beginning. So I was able to do that and also cut things down. There was some trimming that people wanted me to do. And then Mrs. Thickens and Mrs. Cooper don't have a big laugh because Mrs. Thickens is out. <laughs> so okay. here's how it, here's how it uh, came out. Not too different at the beginning, but uh, definitely different as we go through. There weren't nobody in Pucky's Huddle, Missouri that wanted to see Byron Dog Willow hang, except the Braithwaite family and Miss Coover, I suppose. Miss Coover hated Byron Dog Willow and weren't shy about saying so neither. After he got himself arrested for gunning down two of the Braithwaite's good horses, Miss Coover said, Byron Dog Willow is a black tooth reprobate. That man's eating the food somebody's good coon dog could have. So, abbreviated and also got something a bit exciting that everyone said they wanted to see at the beginning that gets them engaged, you know, why, why is he being hanged? And, and, and if he shot two horses, then why did he do that? And uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea, but I, I don't really know. I think it's going to have something to do with drinking too much moonshine. And he, I know he's going to do it with no pants on. So that's really, <laughs> that's really uh, and I also like the set stories. This is set back in the times of like Jesse James and stuff. So I, I like, I love setting stories back in, in other times so i can use words and things that i like old-fashioned stuff so to any unpublished authors listening to this what are your primary pieces of advice their goal is to get published yeah if not for not just contest or for money but they want to have their words in print yeah. by somebody who says yes we accept yeah i mean that's the greatest thing in the world to say you're good this is good we want to put it on you know we want to publish it even if you're just getting, if it's online, I mean, you know, all your friends can see it, or, or if it's published in a magazine, it's great. It's a great thing. So my main tips uh, would be to go to the review review, read. They have numerous tips on getting published, how to format, how to how to submit, um, how to narrow down the the, the the magazines that you're going to submit to. I think that's a really good way to to do that. And then, um, of course. Every one of them says this in their guidelines. It's like, please read some of the stories that we've already published because you need to understand what our aesthetic is, what we tend to like, what we tend to publish. And if you're, you know, if you're putting a science fiction story and they don't publish science fiction stories, then, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're completely wasted a submission. So you need to really, you know, you need to make a list of who you're going to do, send these to, and then uh, really spend the time, a little bit of time. It doesn't take a lot of time, but. Um, if you can read a little bit about, maybe want, read the review in the review review of their magazine and, and you'll get a better idea of what they want. Um, and then one of my other things is that I, I really think you need to keep a notebook if you're not going to be in submittable, uh, which you really should be. Um, you need to, you know, keep very close, uh, not even a notebook. You can use like a, a thing on, what's that called in Microsoft Word, Excel. I never use Excel. I, I was terrible at math. I could never get my math teachers to understand that my answers weren't meant to be taken literally. So <laughs> you're a science and math guy. You get that one. So um, you, you should keep an Excel sheet, though. It lists all the magazines. And then you can put declined, accepted. And then you can contact them if you're, if you're especially, you have to have that in a way for the, all the ones that don't aren't using submittable because you have to contact, that's a really important thing. But I would just continue to study and work and improve your writing, read. There's so much stuff out there. Carve Magazine, have I mentioned that yet? Not yet. Carve Magazine, they have every one of the stories that they've published from the beginning of their the time that they've been on there since it's like 2001, and they believe that great, great fiction should not disappear. It should be available all the time. So everything they've ever done. The stories there are magnificent. I did mention their literary services, I think, but um, I just think the stories there are magnificent and so many of them have had a great effect on me and, and uh, you know, you just can't, I don't think you can read enough. And try try your hand at like flash fiction, non, nano fiction, this sort of stuff. See see if you can do that because it's, it's, a, it's not so much work and uh, you can get your stuff published. And I mean, I tried my hand at it and it was successful. So um, I feel like I've done that, <laughs> but um, some of the other stuff that I 
I always talk about, and you, you know this because uh, I think that now at the group, I'm known as the adverb killer. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I just Which go I around appreciate. and I ax every, I just put an X through. I just, I just, I, now I just go, I put an X through all your adverbs. So here you can just have the paper and you can look at them. But um, sometimes people ask me what, what I, why I don't like them. Uh, and it's just simply, and, and this is not, again, not my own. I, I, I read this so many places. Yeah. Um, but I, I like to give this example because I think it's a good one. My wife's name is Kim, but I just, I use this. Her, her brother's name is Tom. So I'm just using that, but I always use this as my example to people. Uh, Kim went home hurriedly because Tom had arrived. Well, hurriedly, that's a pretty bad in home hurriedly. I don't like that at all. So hurriedly right away, that's out. But if you improve, you know, your, your verb is went. So if you improve the verb, Kim ran home quickly because Tom had arrived. Do you really need still, quickly? Still ran, not, yeah. Ran, though. I mean, ran's not Is bad. Is there any other way to run than to do it quickly? Well, how about if you wrote, Kim raced home because Tom had arrived. So now you've picked the most muscular verb that describes how she's going home, and, you, and you're not using the... the uh... And then, of course, adverbs and dialogue attribution drive me mad, like insane. You know, like... Uh, Get out of here, Tom said angrily. I was like, oh, ah, stop. Write it, write what he said, you know, so that we understand that he's angry. You know, so and, that's what I do. Yeah. And do you think it's the best thing for writers to have small, small works published all, all over the place for, I, I figure, small monetary gain? Yeah. There, you, I mean, you can, you can, Type in Google literary magazines that pay to publish your stories. You know, you'll you'll get like ten different places that list their favorites. You know, you can. I looked up uh, when I was when I was doing the microfiction. I looked up you know the best m the microfiction su online microfiction sites that get the most hits. And you know that's what I was trying to. I, I submitted to those magazines. So you know that's that's it's all out there. And I I think the more you publish, the more confidence you have. It gives you the impetus to, you know, who knows, maybe someday I will write a novel. Uh, but right now I'm, I've got a lot of short stories that I want to get out there. And I, I think that the experiences that I've had up till now have, have, have really improved. And I think being a member of this group has, has given me a huge amount of um, feedback and just uh, being able to listen and give notes to the other writers about what they're doing. I'm learning so much and you know, that's why I'm there all the time. You know, I'm the first one there. I'm getting ready because I want to, uh, I, I want to read and I want to, I want to critique the other stories. And I think it's very valuable. And I, they're, they're like John, as we mentioned John earlier, you know, I just, I really, really love, uh, his stuff that he writes. Cause he, he really gets, he, he sort of understands my writing pretty well and what I'm trying to do. And he, he tends to like it too. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, different people at the group will jive with different amounts of people. Right, I also yeah. kind of jive with John. Well, last week I, I was reading uh, that one story uh, about the, uh, the sheriff in Florida, you know, and uh, that's, sort, that's sort of like I described that as my beast because that, that was the part that I took out of the original story. That, that was the 3,000 word back story. And I'm trying to make that into its own story. And uh, I, was, when I was getting ready to read it. I was like, oh, John's not here. And so I was going to, I would say, I wrote on one of the blank ones that no one used. I said, I wrote, you know, I hate to do this to you, but could you look at this over the week and, and hand it back to me? Well, here he got a hold of it somehow. And when we were done, he said, do you have a minute? I'm, I'm almost done with your story. And I, I, if you could just sit with me for a few minutes and then we'll go over it. I was like, oh, great. Yeah, great. This is perfect. Because he, he was able to give me some pretty, pretty good stuff. And uh, everyone, I mean, even when. You know, you may disagree with what they say. I think it's still good to hear it because if enough people say it, then you might have to go back and say, well, maybe I'm, I'm not as right as I think I am. Not yeah, that, I've know? definitely heard things that I disagree with. And I'm like, where did anybody get this from? But then I hear it from enough people. And it's not that it's not it's not that they're all extrapolating something, something that's just not that's not physically there where there's no, no nothing that leads them to their conclusion except for the framing and it tells me that i need to change the framing because it's drawing them to a place where i don't want to be even though the source i don't think is there it still makes the the barrel of the gun if we will point it in the wrong direction well uh, you know uh 
I think uh, in, in your case, I know what we're talking about, you know, is, is the, is your story or is the novel that you're writing. And uh, I think part of that has to do with the names that you choose, which are great names, but they seem, uh, same futuristic. They're all real names. I know, but they seem <laughs> futuristic. So, so I think that's part of it. And you know, and you know how much I love names. You know, I'm I'm a big name person. Uh, mm -hmm. I, as I said, you know, I, I keep it. I keep a very comprehensive notebook. Uh, not not on a tablet or anything. I I keep it uh, by by me all the time. I have a small one I carry with me everywhere I go. And I I just have pages and pages of names. I hear a name on a show i hear a name on dateline nbc on the news and i'm like oh that's a cool name i read that name now um but then the other thing i i like to do even though i use a lot of uh, neat names and stuff um sometimes i like to take something and make it significant to the story even though if nobody ever looks it up they're going to it's it, it, it's part of the story so i pick a, I, I i look up names that mean you know uh defensive names that mean holy or whatever you know what i mean so so um if i want the character so i look through those names and and find the name that i want that works for the story so that so that not only is it a good name but it's a name that means something within the story even if nobody ever gets that you did that i think that's really cool and pretty important if you can if you can do little it. easter eggs in your story I guess. exactly yeah little easter eggs that's exactly it as a matter of fact uh i was going to talk about um you were talking one night about how certain words can have a lot of power cutters wood sounds cool to me it really it seems it has those nice consonants, consonants that we yeah. really love to use the then, t as you say plant those easter eggs in stories and make them make them part of it if you can but if not just do like you do and, and i do sometimes just just use cool names but uh, that's what i think's happening to you is that the names are like you know so cool that i think people they think they're futuristic names but they're not well it's, it's also telling me that i can't be cute with the city in in just implying which city it is i need mm -hmm. to say this is san francisco it is present day right um, or or say something like, say something significant event that puts yeah. us plant this plants us right here in the present yeah day. and 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 you, we'll we'll get to those because mm -hmm. i mean i hope because yeah. i mean memorable things happen every year that if you are taking place during a certain year you are remiss to forget those significant things that happen yeah i mean just you if there's if there's a if you're taking place in 2016 and the shootings in paris don't come up anywhere it'd be your readers may not notice it but it would ground you more when you have it that oh this place this is the place in time just like in argo there's things if you if you've seen it with the iranian hostage crisis they use the real footage and they use yes. real things that were going around at the time that helped ground you in the place but the anyway film, the film argo yeah yeah but anyway i don't want to keep going on about that about for on the review review there's also a selection for non-paid publications sure there's why, a lot of those. why would you why would do, would do you do that and do yeah. you think it's worth it oh absolutely yeah i mean uh, the the nano fiction piece that was published it wasn't a paid piece you know but uh, yeah i think that's 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 fine you know i mean you're you're trying to write um you're trying to get your writing out there uh give your friends a chance to read it um and it gives you you know every publishing every time you get published it, it just improves your your resume um I, I just think that's great there's a lot of them out there that, and and i mean these people are that are running these online magazines and, and, and some of this stuff. I mean, they, they're doing this just for the love of doing it. They're, they're not making any money. It's costing them money. Um, they all have regular jobs and they have to spend a lot of time and get a lot of people to help them read this stuff and, and get back to people. And I mean, look at Bartleby Snopes. It's, it's extraordinary it's feedback. I mean, wow. That's, a, that's unbelievable. You know? So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's fine. I mean, if my story hadn't won story of the month, I wouldn't have, it would have been free um you know it would have been a, 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 i wouldn't have got money but that was what happened and it was it was great so i think yeah i think that maybe you need to start with that and like the I, they also sent me this copy of, well, i don't know how much they charge for this but they sent me this beautiful copy of the magazine here that i that i have and uh 
it's a great thing to have. I mean, I was just looking. I didn't even notice this until today when I was going to bring it. And there's a list of all the authors, and there's my name. It's kind of exciting on the back on the on the back cover. So I, mean, I was like, that's pretty neat, you know. Um, so I think that's. I think you need that to get yourself. I think you need a group like we're in. I think that's a big help. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need to do a lot of reading. I think you need to do a lot of research. I think you need to really work on uh, writing tips, ways to improve your writing, but but also get yourself published because that's gonna that's gonna build your confidence. It's gonna build your abilities to to find ways to get into these and win these contests and and get get your stuff published by the magazines that really do publish and, and pay you well. And do you find that other publishers will really pay attention to what you already have out there, even if it's been unpaid? Some do. I mean, I, well, I think if they're if they're considering publishing your piece, that's most of them don't read your biography or any information about you really until um, until they they maybe it's jumped through two or three you know, people that say, hey, there's something here. I'm, you know, as opposed so, to googling you and seeing right. if you pop up. Uh, which is exciting for me because now when you write Scott McClellan writer, it, I come up and it's my yellow cup with the tiger on. That's neat. Push yeah. card prize. <laughs> so yeah, that's neat. I I I didn't think that was going to happen so fast, but so yeah, they they read your biography and you can put in there as I say, I like, have a push. That's all I need. Scott McClellan is a push card prize nominating nominated author from Erie, Pennsylvania. That's probably all I'll put now. Um, that's all I have to put. Um, so all the other stuff I don't have to to put in there. Um, I also have something in my biography, though, that I put in every one. I, I always put, uh, Scott is not comfortable in any home that has no pickles. That's that's at the end of my biography. I have pickles. <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> I, do I have love. Pickles. Maybe I should have brought those out beforehand. I ate a whole jar of pickles last night. Well, there are, are there any other websites you'd like to suggest? I would just go on and put in, you know, the best literary magazines and see what that comes up on in Google. Click into those, and if they offer short stories to read, uh, I think you should. I think you should sit down and, and and read five or six of those stories. It gives you a really good idea of what people are doing. I mean, obviously everybody says you have to read, you have to read, you have to read, and sometimes that's hard. You don't have time to read a novel or something. Of course, I don't have time to read a novel. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even think of it, but. Uh, sometimes I can't even get through short stories if it, if it loses me or I'm like, ah, it's going on too long. So, but it, I think it's really good to see what's going on out there and how, the, how it's done. Another, uh, literary magazine that I think is really great. Um, if you enter their contest, uh, it's called one story. Have you ever heard of that? I have not. Um, and what they do is, um, if you enter the contest, it's like $10 to enter the contest and, um, you get a half a year's of their publications and what they do is they send out you, you'll get this little this envelope in the mail it's about like you know maybe seven or eight inches wide and, and and like five inches tall and inside there is this very small little paperback book you know uh it's not a pamphlet i mean it's it's a decent sized book probably i don't know 25 pages long and it's one story and so about every three weeks you get a story in the mail for six months and uh it's not i think it's not like 21 dollars a year to to have it come all the time and i found those stories to be just amazing i mean you know wow they're they're really good so if you can i don't think you can read any one story stuff online and maybe a little bit but uh oh man every three weeks just you've got something to sit and read and and, and they're so good so carve magazine the missouri review is another one that, that really has a lot of stories that you can read uh, without paying to read them or anything and, and so other than that, though, I recommend any place that's got writing advice, uh, sign up for their newsletter, sign up for the review, review newsletter, sign up for Aerogram, uh, Write by Night. I mentioned them as one of the groups that I, uh, I wrote an article about, their, their literary services. They have a huge amount of, of uh, resources and information on their site that, that, uh, that you can read and help, help you with your the blogs about getting published and stuff like that. Uh, huge resource. And then the one that published my uh, flash fiction piece is called Every Writer's Resource. I mean, how much do you, more do you need? <laughs> that's Every Writer's Resource. And there's a lot of information there. So that's what I'm recommending to people. And uh, I think that getting published is a, is a great thing, whether they're paying you nothing or, or if you're getting money. I think it, it builds your confidence and, build, and, and, and gets you going, gets you started. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me. It was great. 
Thank you very much for joining us. I am J. Brian Jones, as you just heard, the host and producer of this program. That was Scott McClellan. My guest next will be John Law. The president and CEO of Coffee House Writers Group is Christine Bryant. Our director of technology is Steve Hirschberger. One of these comes out every month on a Thursday. It may vary which Thursday. We'll get that exact, more exact as time goes on. And when these posts will be announced on Facebook and on Twitter, so be sure to follow those. And until next time, go forth and create. Thank you.